Can we slip our hands up and just worship the Lord Jesus? God, we love you tonight, Lord. We give you praise and glory, God. I'm so thankful, God, that we can come to your house and you meet us here, God, in a special way. We give you thanks tonight, God. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you tonight, Lord. Oh, in spirit and in truth, God, in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit upon this service, God. Meet us in, in our point of need, God. Meet us at that place, God, that helps us to, to join our spirits with your spirit tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house, it's good to see all your smiling faces, praise God. Sister Karen, you don't have to do that unless, okay, well, I'll, I'll let you use your best discretion. But uh, anyway, uh, we are here tonight and we are going to, we got two more lessons on the oneness of God. And uh, tonight we're going to actually combine three chapters into one. And uh, so I've asked Waylon if he'll be a timer, and he's going to give me 15 minutes per chapter, and I'm going to do my best to skim through it and bring out some good points. And when he says time, I'm going to move on to the next chapter, okay? So uh, with that, we're going to talk about the Old Testament questions, you know, where it, uh, the Trinitarians pull out a uh, scripture and say that proves a trinity. We're going to do some explaining. We're going to talk about that. Then we're going to go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and do the same thing. And then we're going to go from the book of Acts to Revelation and do the same thing. Fifteen minutes in each section. Can you say, say, Pastor, you can do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So uh, I got the, the idea from Brother Hurst. He uh, was uh, at Eureka doing, I believe it was a marriage seminar, wasn't it, Cindy, about a year ago. And uh, he broke out with the men, and he had some topics to talk about. And he had Marcus Jones with the stopwatch. And Marcus had yelled time, and he'd go on to the next topic. So I figured if it'll work for Brother Hurst, it'll work for us here. Amen. We need to pray tonight. Sister Judy is not here. So you need to pray for your ear. No, I'm just kidding. You need to, we need to keep Judy in prayer. She has her car that's blowing blue smoke out the back end. And uh, from my understanding, that means she's got a head gasket problem. But uh, she wants her mechanic to figure it out and get it fixed. So let's pray that happens. Then we need to pray for Zulabel. Zulabel's having eye problems. And then Sister Anderson is just low on energy. Let's pray God would energize her. And uh, then I also want to pray for Isabel, who was here, our guest, last week. And then John, who was our guest on Sunday. And I don't know if you noticed, but I did. When K.O. got up here and, and the Holy Ghost started moving, John's eyes went like that. <laughs> so I'm praying he, uh, he got a, a good dose of the Holy Ghost. He, he, was, he was back there, went back and prayed for him. And uh, he kept stif stifling and stuffing the, the speaking in tongues, but God was trying to give him the Holy Ghost. And I kept saying, that's the Holy Ghost. 
but uh, praise the Lord. I'm praying he comes back as well. So pray for Isabel and pray for John. Amen. Jesus, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God. You're able to do all things. We lift up Judy and her car to you. Ask you, God, that you would help that mechanic to diagnose the problem and get it fixed. Pray for Zula Bell, God. <coughs> Touch her eyes tonight, Lord. Give her clear vision. Help her to see. Help her not to have to battle the uh, her eyesight. And, and, Lord, we lift up Sue Anderson to you right now. Ask you, God, that you would just give her strength, give her uh, just energy to be able to function throughout the day. Lord, touch Crystal tonight. Crystal's been battling a cough and, and pneumonia and all this stuff going around. Help her to get well. Help her to get back in church. I pray that in Jesus' name. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We give you honor, God. Draw Isabel and John back to the house of God, Lord, that they might come to know you in a special way, that they would know you in spirit and in truth. I pray, God, that uh, what they heard when they were here, what they experienced when they were here would be enough to just put a hook in their jaw and draw them back to the house of God. I pray that in Jesus' name. Someone say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So we are going to sing. I said we. <laughs> That's all of us. Amen. So let's stand to our feet and let's sing. Amen. We're going to sing about the great name first. Sing with me now. Lost our strength, find, find their, their way, way at the sound, sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name.
let's lift our hands and worship him. Jesus, your name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Oh, I thank you, God, for that name being applied to my life, God. I thank you that in the waters of baptism it was called over my burial, God. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you thanks, we give you praise. The Holy Ghost is in the house right now. If you reach out, he'll, he'll pass by. You can touch the hem of his garment, whatever you have need of. He's here to provide. He's here to heal. In the name of Jesus. Take a minute, let's just talk to God. We always get in a hurry and we always try and keep a schedule. But God is not on a schedule. He's interrupting this service right now for you, for you, for you. In Jesus' name. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, God. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Dennis, Jesus bless this offering. Let it go to your intended purpose in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for being in this house in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give. Praise the Lord. I do have, um, well, I pretty much know we've got two lessons left in our Exploring God's Word Bible study. We're on uh, lesson 11. And um, we're going to be talking a bit about prophecy and uh, how we know the Bible is true. And, and prophecy is one way we know the Bible is true. When God says something ahead of time and then it happens, that proves that God's word is true. And uh, we're going to start at the destruction of Jerusalem. Actually, we may end up going a little bit before that, but pray for me because I've been trying to get the, uh, the leading of the Spirit because I want to tie this all up and bring it to a, a close. And then uh, once we're done with exploring God's Word, we're going to actually dive into the topic of forgiveness and dealing with shame. Um, the, there's... Um, a few people on the Exploring God's Word Bible study, Zoom Bible study, that have expressed a need and a want to be healed. And I'm believing God wants that too. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. So uh, God bless you. Well, one more song. It's a year of evangelism. Sing with me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of the servant Moses, righteousness being. Days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sorrow. Still we are the voice in the desert crying. Salve. 
dry bones becoming as fresh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are all white in the salvation for Fortuna, California. I am believing God's going to do a great work the rest of this year. We're already a third of the way through the year. Think about that. And uh, praise God. I'm grateful for what God's done, but I believe God wants to do more. Amen. So while we were singing that and we talked about Ezekiel, well, sang about Ezekiel's dry bones, I think that's where I'm going to start on Monday night. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Jesus, God, be with me tonight. Help me, Lord, to speak your word. Help me, God, to teach your word and to be able to answer questions that we have in our heart and mind. I pray that in your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so before you start the clock, God bless you. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. I got to get the mind of the Spirit here. Hallelujah. So, um, gosh, I had something I was going to say. Better start the clock. (laughs) Okay, so we are going to go through Old Testament, and we're going to hit some topics. And um, these are are questions that are brought up or, or arguments that are brought up by Trinitarians to prove the Trinity. And then from there, once Waylon yells time, We're going to move to the New Testament, and we're going to start in the Gospels, and then from there we'll hit the rest of the book. Are you with me? All right. Jesus' name. You got your clock ready? Start the timer. Praise the Lord. So, Old Testament explanations. First of all, we've got a number of things that people point to that say that, well, God's a trinity. First of all is the the term Elohim. 
Okay, we talked about that. Go to Deuteronomy 6 and 4. And it, that word Lord that's all capitals comes from the very word, the Hebrew word Elohim. Okay, and, and what it means is Lord, but it's a special Lord because it actually is Lord that substitutes the name of God. The Jews did not want to be so complacent by using Jehovah over and over and over and over. So they substituted in the, the title of Elohim. And so when the translators um, translated the Bible, they wrote it in all caps. We've talked about this before. How many of you have said, yeah, I've heard this before? Okay, we got a couple of you already. So, but, but I want to try and give you a little twist. The Hebrew word Elohim is actually a plural word. It, it actually means uh, Elohim is a plural, okay? So the Trinitarians point to Elohim and say, well, God's a plural. There's more than one God, more than one person of God. Better be careful how I phrase that, amen? But with that, that being said, let, let's talk about this. So it's a plural form of the Hebrew word Eloah, which means God or deity. And most scholars agree that the use of the plural indicates God's greatness or his multiple attributes, but it does not imply a plurality of persons. The Hebrew pluralized noun to express greatness or majesty, that's what Elohim is. And so the Bible reveals that the only way to understand the plural of Elohim is that it expresses his greatness or his multiple modes of operation. It does not indicate a plurality of persons. Are you with me so far? So, so also we see that when... Um, Elohim identifies the singular manifestation. Go to Genesis 32 and 30. What's my time? I'm kidding. 32, 30, it says, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God, and that word there is Elohim, okay, face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob did not wrestle with three people. He wrestled with one God. So the manifestation of Elohim is singular. Are you with me? Also, we see that, that the, the, okay, I want to make sure I got this right. The, hu the uh, human king in uh, the book of Amos, I believe it's in Amos, he uses the word Elohim, He's, and he calls, they call him Elohim, kings, uh, the, the god Chemosh, and the god uh, Ashtaroth, and the god uh, Dagon, and the god um, Baal are all called Elohim. Now, we wouldn't argue and say that there's three Baals, or that there's three Chemosh, or there's three Molochs, or... The, the, there's one deity that they assign that word to. And again, it comes back to the plurality, the majesty, the greatness that is assigned to that, that God or that idol. Are you with me there? Okay, Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image. So here, the plural pronoun is used for our image. And, uh, and so, go to verse 27. 
But in the next verse, it doesn't say they created man in his own image. It says God created man in his singular own image. So, the, again, the Trinitarians try to say that because it says our more than one. Go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, and I want to say 8. It says, who will go for us? Okay, this is again Jehovah talking, who will go for us? Now, um, I've got a scripture that I I believe it's Hebrews 11. Um, that's not the one. Hold on. It's in Ephesians. Uh, that's not it either. There, there's a scripture, I believe it's in Ephesians, talks about God counsels with his own will. Okay, um, I know it's in there. His own will. Maybe that's not the way it's phrased. Ephesians 1 and 11 Sorry, I was thinking it was Hebrews 11. So it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God counsels himself just like you counsel yourself. And you say in the morning, let's see what am I going to do today? And that, that us, let us see, because L-E-T apostrophe S, really is let us see. Who are you talking to when you say that? And again, it's, it's talking to yourself in the third person, basically. And God counsels his own self. He said, let us make man in our own image. He's talking to himself that this is what we should do. But when he does the work, he, it says that he created man in his own image. So it's done in the singular sense. We talked last time about the fact that there's also the Jewish tradition says that God was talking to the angels in heaven because they were going to be a part of man's salvation. So he said, let's, together, let's make man in our own image. But of course, we know it was God that did the work. And so it's in a singular sense. Let's keep moving. Um, the theophanies. We talk, we've talked about theophanies. Someone tell me what a theophany is. Brother Cameron. Okay. It's a physical manifestation of the spirit. Okay, Now, I'm going to broaden that when we get into the Gospels. And I'm going to say that it can be more than just a physical manifestation, but it can be an audible manifestation. And when we get to... Uh, Matthew 3, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Are you with me? So because we see a God manifesting himself, and we see in a couple of places, going to um, Genesis 18 and 1, says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent of the door in the heat of the day. This is God coming to Abraham. 
And he's going to talk to him about, number one, he's going to prophesy to him that Sarah's going to have a child in one year. So that means Abraham at this point is about 98, and Sarah's about 89, and and because they're about 10 years apart. And and so remember, Sarah laughs, and and the angel calls her out on it. But the angel didn't just come alone. He came with two other angels. Okay, this angel here is the Lord because it says, and the Lord appeared. The other two angels could be like Michael or, and Gabriel. I, d- I don't know. I would imagine that that's who he travels with. Okay, Michael, the warrior angel, Gabriel, the messenger angel. Okay, but in either case, we've got a, the Trinitarians pointing to the fact that there's three angels, therefore it must be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that appeared. Okay, now we know, according to Scripture, that the other two angels went on and they performed the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the fire and brimstone made it fall on, on Sodom and Gomorrah. But uh, with that, in fact, uh, uh, I don't have time. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Praise the Lord. So the angel of the Lord, uh, there are times that the angel of the Lord appears and, and uh, there are times where the person that it, he appears to falls down and worships him. And, and the angel doesn't say anything about worshiping. Other times the angel says, get up. I'm a created being just like you are. So there are times that God himself appears. And then there's times that he sends his messenger or his warrior angel to appear. Are you with me? So with that, also um, in Proverbs, let's go to Proverbs. And, uh, well, I I don't have time to read all that. But in Proverbs chapter 1 and Proverbs 8 and Proverbs 9, the wisdom of the Lord is talked about as a woman. So is God a woman? Okay, so that we have to understand that there are times that God uses uh, uh, human characteristics to portray something to us. It, like when he says that the breath of God, the nostril of God blew a, blew a highway through the Red Sea. We don't believe that some big nose came out of the sky and and blew the winds and and the Red Sea opened up and they went through it. I mean, that's silly. Okay, so we have to understand that sometimes the Bible uses uh, a uh, picture of, of something that we can relate to so that we can understand what it is he's trying to tell us. Does that make sense? Okay, let's talk about the Ancient of Days. And uh, let's go to Daniel 7. Praise the Lord. In fact, go to Revelation uh, 1, 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, I saw... Seven golden candlesticks, next verse. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, next verse. His head and his hair were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. This actually is a picture of the Ancient of Days talked about in in, uh, the book of Daniel. Um, Praise the Lord, Daniel, where did it go? 7, verse 9 through 28, we don't have time, Cindy. 
Praise the Lord. It's yell time, Waylon. It's yell time. Time. Okay. So, uh, anyway, in the Old Testament, there are a number of different things that the Trinitarians point to, saying that there's a multiplicity, but that's not the case. So, moving on, you can start your clock now. I had to wrap it up. Okay. So, in the Gospels, there are a number of things that, that cause some difficulty for us to understand. And uh, if we understand them clearly, uh, then we, if we understand them in light of the oneness of God, they make perfect sense. But when you try to look at them in light of a trinity, they're confusing. Okay, so let's, let's look at some of these. So when we see a plurality in the New Testament concerning Jesus Christ, we, the, the problem that we have is that it, it, not like the Old Testament, the Old Testament's all spirit, all, God's spirit, amen? But in the New Testament, we have to understand that Jesus is the marriage of spirit and flesh. And there is a duality or a plurality in Christ himself. Does that make sense? That he is man, 100%. He's, he's all boy. And then he's 100% God. So with that, see, we have a human spirit. And the Holy Ghost comes and takes residence in our human spirit. Jesus wasn't like that. His human spirit was God. He was God manifest in the flesh. So he didn't have a human spirit like you and I have. Go to Romans 5 and 12. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore by one man sin entered the world and death by sin so that death passed upon every man, for all have sinned. So we, that's us, we have a human spirit that's trying to act holy, trying to be good, trying to be right, but we struggle with that because we're flesh. Now, Jesus had flesh, but the Bible we just looked at said that sin was passed on by a man, not a woman. We talked about the genetics a couple weeks ago. That Mary gave a recessive sin gene. God gave a recessive sin gene so Jesus was without sin. Are you following me? If you've got a human father, you are a sinner. It's not their fault. They were passed on the same problem. Amen? So, so here's the deal. The Holy Ghost can leave us and we stay alive because we have a human spirit. Jesus having the Holy Spirit as his human spirit, if God left him, like people say, well, he left him on the cross. When he's saying, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, if God left him at that point, Jesus would have died right there. He would have said, dead, spirit's gone. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so he is God manifested in the flesh and so we have to understand that there's a plurality in christ let's go to the baptism of jesus let's go to matthew 3 16 17. so when jesus was baptized he went straightway up out of the water and and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the Spirit of God, 
that John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, say like a dove. It wasn't a real dove. It was like a dove. And, the, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, now, let's, let's stop here and talk about something. Can do, God talk to somebody in China right now, even though he's here talking to you? Can he go to youth convention and talk to our youth? Same time. Same God, he's omnipresent, right? He's everywhere all at the same time. So he's able to be here and there at the same time. I'm going somewhere with this. So we got Jesus in the water being baptized. We have the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, descending upon him like a dove. Same God. Just a different, different form, different uh, manifestation, a theophany that is showing something to who? To, to John. The dove was for John. Who was the voice for? Now say it. The crowd. It was for the people. Okay. So we have to understand that even while the d dove is descending like a dove, and I, here's my rendition of this, okay? I don't have, you know, scripture for it, but I'm just using my imagination. When a dove comes in to land, what does it do? It flutters and lights down on the ground. I believe the Holy Ghost was fluttering around Christ. And it looked to John like a dove coming in to land. And so it lighted upon him. And John said, ah, oh, that's the Messiah, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That was John's sign. And he was told to look for that. Amen. So, so that's a manifestation. Now, I said earlier that theophanies can also be audible. The voice is not the Father sitting on the throne. The voice is a theophany of God that was manifested for that time for the people. And what did the voice say? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Let me interpret that for you means in whom I am well pleased to dwell. Go to Colossians, I think it's 1 and 15. I hope it's, it might be 19. 19, sorry. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. In him. Okay. Similarly, he's saying, I am pleased in him. Okay. The old English is probably a little bit harder to understand. But it, it's God saying, I am in Christ. And, and the, the Greek, the, the, oh, I wish I had time. I wish I had time. I would get lost in this. But the Greek word is that it's a place of position. It, it's a place, not just, oh, I'm proud of him. Okay? And so we, we have to understand that the baptism of Christ does not show a trinity with a voice in heaven, a dove, the Holy Ghost, lighting upon him, and Christ in the water. Are you with me? Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, to the cross. Go to Matthew 27, verse 46. I wish you could see my book. I got notes everywhere. And, and you know what? I wrote these in year 2000 when I got saved. 
because I was learning about, I mean, I mean you, you go through all this and there's notes everywhere. It, it's, it's a beautiful topic. Sister Crystal was texting us on the way to church saying, my favorite topic tonight. And, and it's mine too. I, I love the, the oneness of God. I'm thankful. I am, let's just stop here right now. And let's thank God a moment for him, his revelation to us of who he is. Amen. Let, in the name of Jesus, thank you, God, for revealing yourself to us. Thank you, Lord, that you have poured out your spirit and you have talked to us and showed us in scripture, Lord, that you are one God. You are the one God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. How much time I got? Oh, cool, man. We're doing good. Okay, uh, Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this is uh, used by the Trinitarian to show that the spirit of God left Jesus Christ. Okay, and that's not true. We've talked, we just got done talking about the fact that Jesus' spirit was inseparable from his flesh. If your human spirit leaves, you die. If Jesus' spirit left him and he had all the fullness of the Godhead in him in bodily form. If that spirit left him, he's dead. So to, we understand that while the flesh suffered, there was no help from the divine spirit. However, the spirit... Okay. So the Holy Ghost did not aid Christ in any way to go through the crucifixion as in giving him some sort of a novocaine, spiritual novocaine. It, that's for you, Karen. It, she's a hygienist. So. But he, he didn't aid Christ in any way. But the spirit in him here was, was God. Okay, but the flesh still suffered. He felt pain just like you and I would feel pain. He, he felt the nails just like you and I would feel the nails. He felt the whip. He felt the, the cat and nine tails just like you and I would feel it. But God didn't aid him in any way. Okay, if we say that God left him, forsook him on the cross then Jesus would have died at that very moment. But that's not the case. It, it was that um, he, he was there, but he withdrew himself. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a trial where you're saying, God, where are you? Amen. We all have. You know, it's like, God. I'm doing all the right things, but where are you? Why aren't you showing up? And that's similar to what Jesus was facing on the cross. What he was feeling at that moment was that he was abandoned by God, but really it's not that God left him. It's that God allowed the trial to take place. We go through trials because God allows it to take place. Can you say amen? And so Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. He took our place. And so thank you, Jesus, for that. Okay, let's go to Matthew 28, 19. Just real quick, I got to mention this. We've talked about this. Beat the dead horse. You guys know the scripture. It says that we're to baptize in the name 
of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And Trinitarians point to that and say that that tells us that God is three persons. But with that being said, the focus here is not on plurality. What's the focus on? The name. One name. Amen? So that, that talk about this being a Trinitarian baptismal formula does not hold water. Now, one other thing. Go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. They point to that word with and say that that proves that God is that at least two people, okay? That, that the word or the, the son was with God, the father. But again, that word with in the... In the uh, Greek is the word pros, P-R-O-S. And that word pros, every other place in your Bible is translated as pertaining to. So in the beginning was the word and the word pertained to God and the word was God. Just like your word is yours. Did you yell time? You got to yell it, man. I'm telling you, I'll keep going. Praise the Lord. All right. Next. Thank you for doing that, Waylon. But don't let me keep going. You got to tackle me. Oh, man, I'm missing all kinds of stuff here. Okay. All right. From the book of Acts to the book of Revelation. Um, we've got a number of uh, things that the Trinitarians point to. Let's go to Acts 2 and 34. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith, to, saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit on my right hand. Go to Psalms 110.1. Psalms 110 and 1. This is what it was quoting from, by the way. Peter was quoting from Psalms. He said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, so Acts says he's sitting on his right hand. Psalm says he's at or beside his right hand. So again, the Trinitarians point to this saying that that proves that God is two people at least because the Son is at the right side or the right hand of the Father. But with that understanding, we have to understand that first of all, the Father does not have a physical body. He is an infinite spirit. How do you find the right side or the right hand of a, phys uh, a, a spirit being? A, an infinite spirit being. So you can't. Okay? There, you could travel from here to San Francisco and not find God's right side. You could travel up to Seattle and not find God's right side. You could travel to New York and not find God's right side. You can go from here to Hawaii. Let's go. Amen. From here to Hawaii and not find God's right side. Because God does not have a corporeal, physical body. Amen. So the right hand is symbolic. It, it's talking about the right hand of power, okay? And so it is a physical, interp a physical interpretation of the right hand of God causes problems. Think about this. If 
God had a right hand. Father had a right hand and the son is standing next to him or even sitting on his right hand. Now you have two separate beings. Now you've, you've crossed into ditheism. Two gods. And when you throw the Holy Ghost in the mix, now you're in the, the lane of, of tritheism or three gods. Okay, So we cannot take from the Bible the right hand and use that to prove that God is a multiple persons or multiple attributes of God. Okay, um, let's talk here about the greetings in the epistles. Let's go to um, Galatians 1 and 4. It says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil word world according to the will of God and our Father. So, so now, if, if the word and separates persons in the Godhead, we got another problem now. Now there's four. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, go back, and God. God and the Father. If, if you use the word and to denote two people, now we got a problem. Go back to Matthew 28, 19. I know. Huh? Okay, good preaching. Thank you. I got the, the, the green light from our media department. So notice he's saying, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and again, the Trinitarians say, and denotes a separation of persons. Are you, you understanding what I'm saying? Okay, so I want to talk to you. Where'd it go? Hold on. Oh, this is good. Oh, I lost it. I found the Granville Sharp's Greek grammatical rule of interpretation. And where did it go? I wanted to read it to you. I told you that I was going to. Are you with me? Pray I find this. Oh, come on, where'd you go? I know it's in here. Oh, you know what? I think it was. Wait a minute. I wonder if it's in the back. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. All right. I love this book. Conclusion. Let's go into the next. I think it's in here. Okay, well, I'm probably going to have to just tell it to you myself. Hold on. Real quick, real quick. Origin. Buddhism. Okay, so, praise the Lord. Okay, well, here we go. Go to, go to, um, Ephesians, no, Colossians 2 and 2, Colossians 2 and 2. As soon as we get, oh, I found it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> okay. Ephesians, or Colossians 2 and 2 talks about 
says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all the riches and fullness of assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Okay, now, the Granville Sharp Greek Grammar Rule. A study of Greek is very interesting in connection with these greeting passages. The word translated as and in the Greek is the Greek word kai, K-A-I. It can be translated as and, even, who is, which is, or is the same as. Okay? For example, the King James Version translates Kai as and. Um, the, let's see, I'm going to skip down here to, okay, the Granville Sharp Rule. Two nouns of the same case and gender. So we have the mystery of God, capital, and of the Father, capital, and of Christ. So let's look at the Father and Christ. Okay? And if they're the same case, uppercase, same gender, and they are both male, and cases are connected by chi, which is the word and in between the Father and Christ. And it says that if the first noun has the definite article, the definite article is the, the Father and Christ, okay? And the second one does not have the definite article, then the nouns both refer to the exact same thing or person. So this is the Father and Christ. So Christ and the Father are both the same. You could say the Father who is Christ. And so that is the Greek. How am I doing? You got me scared. Five minutes. Okay, you said that last time and five minutes went by really quick. <laughs> of course, I got excited. <laughs> Didn't even hear him say time. And then all of a sudden I'm going, he said time. <laughs> so anyway, we have to understand that the and between the uh, title father and Christ does not denote two people. It, again, this brings a problem as a Trinitarian if you're separating. Let's talk about the word person. Okay, let me find that section. How many of you have read through chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 of this book? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let me find. Well, I'm not going to go hunt for that. So, the word person in the Webster's. Somebody on your phone, pull up the word person definition. Come on, Cameron, I'm on the clock. Person definition. Say it again. A human being regarded as an individual. An individual. Okay, so if God is three persons, that's three individuals. Three individuals separates God. And, and here's the deal. When we get next week, when we start looking at the study and the history of the Trinity, there's so many different beliefs about the Trinity that it's crazy. Some believe that, that uh, the Son is not eternal. He was begotten, but, but that he is a, a um, I'm going to get all over the place again. But I'll wait for, for next week for that. But, but the, here's the deal, is that, that God is not persons. Go to Hebrews 
is it one and six? One and four. Being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Keep going. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So the son had a beginning, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son. Six. It says, And again he bringeth into the first begotten into the world, and he saith, let all the angels worship him. That's not what I'm looking for. Hold on. Go to Hebrews 1 and 3. Sorry. I, I, I knew it was either 3 or 6. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express... Image of what? His person, singular. Jesus is a person. He is a human being. So in his mama's side, he is a person. But the God that's, go to Colossians 2 and 9. The God that's in him, the spirit that filled him, is God himself. For in him dwelleth some of the, the, a third of the Godhead. No. Now, is Jesus in the Godhead or is the Godhead in Jesus Christ? The Bible says that the Godhead is in him. What is the Godhead? It's the characteristic of being God. Okay? So in Christ is the fullness of God's spirit. Okay, let, let's... Pretend that we're underwater. Okay, this is the ocean. And I pop the top and this bottle fills up with the ocean. Okay, the, the ocean in the bottle is the same ocean out here. I'm going to finish this one, okay? <laughs> the, the ocean out here, we could say, is the omnipresent spirit of God everywhere at the same time but yet in Christ that same spirit filled him up to overflowing and he had all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in human form do you understand okay before I stop tonight not on the clock are there any questions that you might have regarding the Godhead or any questions regarding scripture? Okay, Jesus, Lord, I thank you, God, for all that you're doing here tonight. I thank you for the witness of the Spirit. I thank you for the testimony of your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you alone are God and that you are that manifestation of God. Lord, before you became a babe in Bethlehem, we could not see God the Father. He was invisible to us. We couldn't relate to him. We couldn't touch him. We couldn't talk to him in, in any tangible way, God. But since you are begotten in that manger in Bethlehem, we now have an object of worship. We can see you. We can worship you. We can touch you we can talk to you in the name of Jesus when we get to heaven and we stand before the throne we're going to worship you for all eternity as mighty God the everlasting father our prince of peace and I thank you for that God I thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ let's do one last bonus Scripture. Let's go to Revelation 22 and 1. Hallelujah. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now that's not two people. 
That's one God who is the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life. Notice a tree of life in the first chapter, tree of life in the very last chapter. God brings it full circle. Which bear twelve manner of fruits and yield her fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Can you say amen? amen. But the throne of God and of the Lamb. Again, that's not two thrones. That's one throne. God, who is the Lamb of God, is sitting on that throne. And he shall be in that throne, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, not their face. And his name, not their name, shall be in their foreheads. And if you read the rest of chapter 22, that's a picture of us in eternity with God. I, I talk to you probably in lesson two, maybe, about the word image. That I believe that it, if you go to search for truth Bible study and you look at like chart number two or three, there's a picture of the angels and the war in heaven. And on that throne is sitting a, a picture of the father in a bodily form. He, he wasn't a, a separate God. He was the God, but it was a way for the, in the eternal spirit beings to worship him. We couldn't see him, but the angels could. If you go on later in the Bible study and you get into the New Testament and we talk about Jesus sitting on the throne, then that it's the exact same picture, but now he's colored in. I believe God, the word of God, the word image of God was in the beginning. And I got, I got scripture for this, okay? I'm not just shooting out of my lip and talking outside of my neck. But, but that God had a picture of what, what he was going to do and who he was going to be. And at the fullness of time, he came and took on that manifestation of humanity. Are you with me? That there is one God. It's God and the Lamb. He became the Lamb. Go to Isaiah 12 and 2. And I'm done after this, Cindy. I know, I know. I... <laughs> Crystal, it's your fault because I, I, this is my favorite topic. Praise the Lord. So it says, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away. Keep going. And thou, 12 and 2, sorry. Go to the next verse. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become. Where did that happen? When Jesus took on the form of a human being. Amen. He didn't become another God. And we're going to talk about the, the arguments of the Trinitarian throughout history next week. But he didn't become another God, a separate God, but he, God, took on human form. Amen. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, God. Bless this, I pray. Help us, God, to take this and, and digest it in our hearts and our minds, God, that we would meditate upon it and understand this principle of the one God manifest in flesh so that we can turn around and lead others to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let's give him a hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you.